Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and since it's early July, we have to talk about Gettysburg some more. I animated the fight for Little Round Top and Devil's Den last week, and this week I want to bring to your attention the account of the Union High Command and how they decided to defend against the Confederate Army on July 3rd at Gettysburg. The account comes from Brigadier General John Gibbon, a division commander in Hancock's 2nd Corps, who was present at the late-night meeting on July 2nd. Gibbon was a North Carolinian and graduate of West Point who sided with the Union when the war broke out. He was among the Army of the Potomac's high command when they decided on the best course of action for July 3rd in what would be the defense against Pickett's charge. Soon after all the firing had ceased, a staff officer from Army headquarters met General Hancock and myself and summoned us both to General Meade's headquarters where a council was being held. We at once proceeded there and soon after our arrival, all the corps commanders were assembled in the little front room of the Leicester House. Newton, who had been assigned to the command of the First Corps over Doubleday, his senior, Hancock of the Second, Burney of the Third, Sykes the Fifth, Sedgwick, who had arrived during the day with the Sixth after a long march from Manchester, Howard the Eleventh, and Slocum the Twelfth, besides General Meade, General Butterfield, Chief of Staff, and Warren, Chief of Engineers, A.S. Williams of the Twelfth Corps, and myself of the Second Corps. It will be seen that two corps were double represented, the Second Corps by Hancock and myself, and the Twelfth by Slocum and Williams. These twelve were all assembled in a little room not more than ten or twelve feet square, with a bed in one corner, a small table on one side, and a chair or two. Of course, all could not sit down. Some did, some lounged on the bed, some stood up whilst Warren, tired out and suffering from a wound in the neck, where a piece of shell had struck him, lay down in the corner of the room and went sound asleep, and I don't think he heard any of the proceedings. The discussion was at first very informal and in the shape of a conversation during which each one made comments on the fight and told what he knew of the condition of the affairs. In the course of his discussion, Newton expressed the opinion that this was no place to fight a battle in. General Newton was an officer of engineers and was rated by me and, I suppose, by most of the others very highly as a soldier. The assertion, therefore, coming from such a source, rather startled me, and I eagerly asked what his objections to the position were. The objections he stated, as I recollect them, related to some minor details of the line, of which I knew nothing except so far as my own front was concerned, and with those I was satisfied. But the prevailing impression seemed to be that the place for the battle had been in a measure selected for us. Here we are, now what is the best thing to do? It soon became evident that everybody was in favor of remaining where we were and giving battle there. General Meade himself said very little except now and then to make some comment, but I cannot recall that he expressed any decided opinion upon any point, preferring apparently to listen to the conversation. After the discussion had lasted for some time, Butterfield suggested that it would, perhaps, be well to formulate the questions to be asked, and General Meade assenting, he took a piece of paper on which he had been making some memoranda and wrote down a question. When he had done so, he read it off and formally proposed it to the council. I had never been a member of a council of war before, nor have I since, and did not feel very confident that I was properly a member of this one, but I had engaged in the discussion and found myself, Warren being asleep, the junior member in it. By the custom of war, the junior member votes first as on courts martial, and when Butterfield read off his first question, the substance of which was should the army remain in its present position or take up some other, he addressed himself first to me for the answer. To say stay and fight was to ignore the objections made by General Newton, and I therefore answered somewhat in this way, remain here and make such corrections in our position as may be deemed necessary, but take no step which even looks like retreat. The question was put to each member and his answer taken down, and when it came to Newton, who was fifth in rank, he voted pretty much in the same way as I had done, and we had some playful sparring as to whether he agreed with me or I with him, and all the rest voted to remain. The next question written by Butterfield was, should the army attack or await the attack of the enemy? I voted not to attack, and all the others voted substantially the same, and on the third question, how long should we wait, I voted until Lee moved. The answers to this last question showed the only material variation in the opinion of the members. When the voting was over, General Meade said quietly but decidedly, 
Such then is the decision. And certainly he said nothing, which produced to my mind a doubt as to his being perfectly in accord with the members of the council. Several times during the sitting of the council, reports were brought to General Meade, and now and then we could hear heavy firing going on over the right of our line. It was nearly midnight before we separated, and before we left the house I saw General Meade in conversation with General Burney, and overheard the former say in rather a curt way, General Hancock is your superior, and I claim the right to issue the order. From which I inferred that Burney had made some comments on the assignment of Hancock to command the Third Corps. I took occasion before leaving to say to General Meade that his staff officer had regularly summoned me as a corps commander to the council, although I had some doubts about being present. He answered pleasantly, that is all right, I wanted you there. General Meade was not himself the ranking officer in the army he commanded, both Reynolds and Sedgwick being his seniors, but Congress had by law empowered the president to assign the junior to command. Meade told me that Secretary of Stanton had telegraphed him that as commander of the Army of the Potomac, he should be supported by the whole power of the War Department. It was upon this, I presume, that General Meade took the responsibility of placing officers of his own choosing in places where he wanted them. Thus, on July 1st, he sent Hancock to command his senior, Howard, assigned me to command my senior in the Second Corps, Newton to command his in the first, and in the midst of battle sent Hancock to command over Bernie, the next in rank to Sickles in that corps. Before I left the house, Meade made a remark to me that surprised me a good deal, especially when I look back upon the occurrence of the next day. By a reference to the votes in the council, it will be seen that the majority of members were in favor of acting on the defensive and awaiting the action of Lee. In referring to the matter, just as the council broke up, Meade said to me, if Lee attacks tomorrow, it will be in your front. I asked him why he thought so, and he replied, because he has made attacks on both our flanks and failed, and if he concludes to try it again, it will be on our center. I expressed a hope that he would, and told General Meade with confidence that if he did, we would defeat him. Meade's reliance upon the doctrine of chances, that having tried each of our wings, Lee would, if he made the third trial, make it upon our center, struck me as somewhat remarkable, but he was right. As I have said, it was near on to midnight when the council broke up, and then Hancock, Newton, and I repaired to a yard near the next house south of Meade's headquarters, and all three crawling into my headquarters ambulance, slept till waked up early the next morning by heavy picket firing on our left near Round Top. Everybody was soon astir, but the morning wore away, and nothing more remarkable seemed to be taking place, although every now and then the cannon on either side would open, or a sudden spurt of picket firing taking place showing that both sides were alert and ready for slaughter when the chiefs gave the word. I can hardly recall how long the hours of the morning wore away or how we occupied our time, but I recollect that the servants at my division headquarters went to work late in the morning to make us coffee and prepare something to eat. One of them had picked up somewhere, no doubt without due process of law, for hungry men are not overscrupulous in regard to other men's rights or chicken an old and tough rooster which was prepared for the pot and made into a stew, and I recollect that I at once went to Meade's headquarters and finding him looking worn and haggard, asked him if he had had any breakfast. He said no, and I urged him to come to my headquarters and share mine. He at first objected, saying he must remain at his headquarters prepared to receive the reports which were constantly coming in and act on them, but I pointed out that we were close at hand in plain sight, that he would be absent but a few minutes, could leave word where he was, and besides, he must keep up his strength. He yielded to my solicitations and went with me, sharing with us our coffee and stewed rooster. But almost immediately after returning to his headquarters, leaving our group of officers seated on the ground chatting over the battle and the probable events of the day. How long we sat there it is impossible to say, but after a long silence, along the line a single gun was heard off in my front and everyone's attention was attracted. 